This episode is brought to you by Datadog, a full-stack monitoring platform that integrates with over 400 technologies like Gremlin, PagerDuty, AWS Lambda, Spinnaker, and more. With rich visualizations and algorithmic alerts, Datadog can help you monitor the effects of chaos experiments, identify weaknesses, and improve the reliability of your systems. Visit datadoghq.com slash Hanselminutes to get a free 14-day trial and receive one of Datadog's famously cozy t-shirts. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm talking with Helen Hosandi. She's the open source uh, director of initiatives at 10up and the lead developer for WordPress. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Well, I'm getting there. Um, <laughs> I'm not uh, not exactly living the dream. Of course, we're recording this uh, during the time of coronavirus, so I am sequestered in my home uh, in yep. Portland, Oregon. Where are you? I am sequestered in my home fully uh, down in San Jose, Costa Rica. Costa Rica. That's where I think we all want to be right now. That sounds amazing. Have you been there a long time? <laughs> um, I have been here. It's been almost two years. Um, my husband is actually Costa Rican, and <laughs> uh, we have two kids. So uh, it got kind of overwhelming to live in the New York metro. Um, I guess it's always kind of overwhelming to live in the New York metro. Uh, but we, a couple of years ago, just kind of gave up on it and moved here to be with family. That sounds amazing. Um I understand. Yeah, certainly with the the, the, the tightness, the tight knit aspect of things in New York, being in the New York subway is not a place to be right now. Yeah, no, I am definitely glad to have space here. Um, and the kids are not going, you know, too wild, I guess, because <laughs> they're not too cooped up, you know. How is your Spanish? I was talking to someone earlier today and they had amazing English. And after they talked to me in English, they were like, oh, I'm so sorry for my, my poor English. And I'm like, oh, I can't. I'm so sorry <laughs> for not speaking another language at all. Yeah. Um, I speak Spanish okay. I think there's this like perfectionist streak in me. So I get really nervous about making mistakes. And so I kind of hate doing it. I'm, I'm the same way about languages in general. And, um, you know, they always use that term idiomatic, whatever, like, you know, I can speak Chipotle Spanish, but if I speak idiomatic Spanish, you know, it doesn't sound right. And then of course I always get in trouble because I was in the Dominican Republic and their Spanish is different than Mexican oh, yeah. Spanish, which is the Spanish that I've learned, which is different than, you know, whatever. So then you, 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 you say some term and they're like, oh my goodness, we don't say that here. That's a swear word. It's like, is it really? Are you sure? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So I'm just afraid about, to say anything. <laughs> lots of jokes about straws, I think, is yes, what it is. Yes, I got things. in yeah. huge trouble with a straw. We'll talk about that another time. In a, we don't, not on this show, but yes, <laughs> right. I got in a horrible, horrible straw based Spanish situation. So, uh, someone, if you see me on the street, friends and listeners of the podcast, feel free to ask me about that <laughs> nightmare situation because that was bad. Yep. And speaking of languages and idiomatic languages, so I, I speak C sharp. Mm -hmm. uh, and you are one of the lead developers on WordPress. WordPress is, is that still primarily or 100% written in PHP on the server side? It is primarily. There's a fair amount of JavaScript now that runs um, the new editor and some other experiences. So that kind of bridges somewhere between PHP and JavaScript on the server side of things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Now, PHP, one time I, I was, uh, you know, we always tease different languages. You always tease the language that you don't speak. And then you talk privately, you know, internally with your group about how your language sucks. Like all of us internally would talk about how C Sharp sucks. But I was teasing once PHP. Uh, I think it was in a talk. And someone said I was language shaming. But then I went and looked at the numbers and PHP is killing it. Like you can tease PHP all they want, but it's like 60 million people using the thing. Yeah, it's um it's it's honestly like a big part of what got me kind of back into computers after a long long time away from them um cuz it's like instant, right? Like you just kind of make this thing go and it's forgiving in both good and bad ways. I think that's what mm -hmm. people really like to make fun of, right? Like you can do these things and in any other language it would be like that's a dumb thing to do, but PHP is like, uh sure, I'll I'll guess. I'll take a guess <laughs> as to what you mean. But that was kind of the fun thing about getting into PHP was that it was forgiving and it let me try a lot of different things. And yeah, and we like to have our fights in public. I think that's another thing about it. It itself being, you know, developed as open source, right? Is that 
all the fights and everything happen in the open. So it gets a lot of attention for that. Why do you think PHP gets a, a bad name? Why do people, why is it, a, is it because it's so popular that people think they can throw rocks at it? Um, I think there are, there are a bunch of different things. I mean, there is the, you know, at least in, in older versions of PHP, how lax it was about a lot of things. Um, just, you know, like typing or yeah, mostly typing, honestly, um, and not having, um, like best practices around how you structure, um, things that you're writing, right? Like it Mm -hmm. used to be a lot of procedural code and a lot of, you know, I I don't know what to call it, but just a lot of sort of elitism around, oh, you're not using objects. Not everything can just be functional all the time. Yeah, I, I think with with that type of usage, I think WordPress is like this too, right? Like with that type of usage, you have a lot of eyes on both the things that are good and the things that are bad, right? So they just kind of get a lot more attention generally. Uh, and we like to pick on things that are bad. But that that loose that looseness that that dynamism, if that's a word, is why it was so successful. I mean, it's a fairly young language; it's only been around for twenty five years. And I think the thing that's most interesting about PHP is that it kind of grew and developed with no formal specification until like five years ago or six years ago. So yeah. for the first twenty years, they were just kind of making stuff up. Yeah, I mean, you can see it. You know, we have they're like. <laughs> There's like a function to find the date of Easter in alternate calendars. Like it, it's just kind of, <laughs> you know, it's a funny language, but you know, we, it, again, it works, right? Like it works. Exactly. We get stuff done. So Exactly. And that's the thing. There's no room for elitism when you're getting work done. Yep. Um, one of the things that uh, we say at Microsoft uh, where I work and my day job is uh, we, we refer to a thing about the developer's inner loop the experience that the developer goes through to make a change and then see the change and how long it takes. Now, my language is strongly typed and compiled. So you could spend a couple seconds or even many seconds where you make a change, compile it, run a test, hit refresh. The power of PHP for me has always been the make a change and hit refresh in the browser. So the amount of time spent, it's just like hit save and then you see immediately what you just did. And I think yeah. that that's always been the success for me. Yes, absolutely. That's that's definitely what drew me in as well. Like I mentioned, it just it was exciting to get into something. Um, I was very briefly a computer science major, double major, and it was in Java at the time. I think was the the uh, the primary language used for classes, um, and mm-hmm. before that, had done some C plus plus. So for me, just coming from compiled languages where everything was very punitive <laughs> almost and and taking forever to you know compile things and required certain resources and all of that. Um, and to come from that and having given up on it because it was so frustrating and I did not have resources available to me the way that they sort of expected you to have mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To, to get into something like PHP where you can just refresh and everything is good. Um, was really exciting. And it kind of reignited my excitement about computers uh, sort of generally. And so now I'm here. I like that because there, like right now, I just, I went, I went, um, my, my nephew's in school at Oregon State and he Skyped me a couple of days ago because he's like, I'm going to be a computer programmer. And he, and they're making him do C++. And he's just, he's hating it. And it's, yeah. it's taking his excitement, which was from age 13 to age 19 and it's just pounding him into the ground because he's, they're like, you know, write a connect four game or do a tic-tac-toe and make oh sure you God. use pointers to pointers to pointers to, to arrays of multidimensional whatever. And he's just like, but this isn't like, this isn't what I signed up for. And it's like when my dad told me, hey, we're going to learn, teach you how to drive. And I'm like, oh, great. Can I drive this car? And he's like, no, no, we're going to learn to drive stick shift first. We're going to make right. you suffer. Right. It's like, right. hey, let's all learn computers. Now, assembly language. Right. Yeah, that's so fun. So you you got you got the fun beaten out of you, and then you found PHP. Yeah, yeah, that's totally what it was. You know, we all started with the like GeoCities aim profiles, putting <laughs> generated HTML playlists from Winamp onto our AOL profiles. Right, and we kind of went from that and tinkering with HTML, and again, the the fun of seeing something just happen when you refreshed and went from that into 
compiled languages. And what you said about like connect four was like, Oh my God, I'm back in AP computer science all over again. Being shoved into that was very like, this is not exciting for me. And this is not something that I relate to. Mm -hmm. Right. Like my, when I thought about if I wanted to do computers for a living, what would I want to do? And for me, it was never like, Oh, I want to write, you know, operating systems. I don't want to write games. What I'm familiar with is the web. Mm -hmm. I'm familiar with stuff on the internet right? That's my my generation, my childhood. And for me, it was very much like, okay, this is not what I want to do. I don't see how it's relevant at all. And I don't want to do it anymore. So I stopped doing it for a long time. People um, who remember like GeoCities and, you know, they've, they've gone and made similar sites. You can find NeoCities. But like, if I talk to someone who's in their 20s and they say, oh man, GeoCities and MySpace and, you know, view source. It's always so disappointing now when you go and do a view source on a website and it's completely unreadable and you go, oh, that's a single div and some JavaScript that's obfuscated. Do you think that WordPress is kind of the new GeoCities? Is there a generation that's WordPress is their their GeoCities? That's the thing that they're hacking on and getting passionate about. I think specifically in the developer and the open source community, yes, there are a significant number of people who came up through a project like WordPress, and for a lot of people, it is exactly WordPress, right? Like hacking on themes or, you know, trying to figure out what the bug is and doing what we always tell people not to do, like hacking core, like, you know, altering core, you know, WordPress files on the server. So we do have a lot of people who've kind of come up through that. And a lot of it, again, is thanks to it being just like PHP, HTML, and basic CSS. Mm -hmm. For a long time, we had no preprocessor whatsoever, and a lot of a lot of opposition to that was that feeling of, you know, as such a large project and one that's so established in the open source community, you know, do we still have an obligation to occupy this sort of like entry level space, right? Where we continue as a project to, you know, not over prioritize tooling over the experience of not just incoming contributors to WordPress, but people who are learning about open source and PHP and CMSs and whatever, you know, all for the first time. Um, and so that's something that we, I think we struggle with a little bit as a project is, you know, how do we move forward with something like Gutenberg, which is the JavaScript React based editor that we have now? Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it's been a couple of years, <laughs> but so we have this, we have this new editor and it's JavaScript based. And so it has, you know, like a build process and, you know, processors and typing. And I, I don't even myself necessarily know what's in there as a lead developer. Um, cause it's a huge project and it kind of runs on its own leadership on the side. Um, and we merge parts of it back into WordPress itself from time to time. So you know, we, we struggle with that is, you know, how do you create a process that still welcomes people to participate, um, Mm -hmm. no matter their skill level and no matter their skill set, right? Because it doesn't necessarily have to be code. We want people to be able to participate in documentation and, you know, community events and that sort of thing as well, right? So how do we balance this desire to move forward and to be modern and all the things that people like to tease WordPress about, right? Like for mm-hmm. not not being on the cutting edge all the time. Um, but how do we balance that with continuing to want to bring people into contributing to open source right, broadly? It's not just about WordPress. Like it's mm-hmm. about that stewardship for anything that you use and that awareness that what you're using is being built by volunteers. And we want everybody to be able to participate in that process and be aware of it. The fact that everything is built by volunteers but there's still there's still a, on the part of the user such a sense of entitlement must be very frustrating. I mean, you must. I'm sure you've been either on the phone or on the other side of a great deal of anger from someone who's personally upset with you because you represent WordPress to them, and their business is now down because they edited a file that they shouldn't have directly on the production server, et cetera, et cetera. Why do they think that they deserve your pound of flesh, even though you're a volunteer? <laughs> It's. I think in the WordPress space, it's a little more complicated than it can be for some other projects. So in the WordPress mm-hmm. space, some people are sponsored to work on things. Mm. Um, Automatic itself sponsors a ton of people to work on just the WordPress core software product itself, right? So that that's their contribution back to, you know, the community that upholds its business. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so my position is the same. I am sponsored to work on WordPress and WordPress related things um, for the most part. Um, I like, I don't work on client stuff, right? So Tenup is an agency. We do client services. Um, I very rarely touch anything on the client front. So my time is a contribution back to uh, the open source community. In that world, it's a little more complicated, I think. Like it, I can understand somebody feeling like I'm personally responsible for something, mm-hmm. right? I would prefer that they not, you know, like be rude to me or call me names, all, all of which have happened. Um, but that part I do understand a little bit better. Um, and I don't, I don't expect people out there who are just running websites to necessarily understand that, you know, this thing exists as a publicly created public good. Um, mm-hmm. I think that that's in human terms and especially in, you know, like the modern world, um, that can be sort of a, just hard to wrap your head around at all, right? It, it's hard. These free products. I mean, my yeah. to my parents, to, to my non-technical parents, Facebook is a product that they feel that they purchased, but they didn't put in a credit card. They just use it. Therefore, it must be a thing. Therefore, someone must support them. Right. Somebody somewhere is making money. Therefore, somebody is getting paid to help me. Is sort mm-hmm. of the the simplified thought process, right? So yeah, so I think WordPress, there are, I think there are fewer and fewer, honestly, significant volunteers in the community, right? So the volunteerism is funded in a lot of ways by other companies who have built their businesses, you know, building WordPress sites or WordPress products. Uh, so in, in our space, it's become a lot of, you know, funded work. So it's volunteerism in that it's voluntary, um, but it's not mm. volunteerism as in it's devoid of any sort of transactional money <laughs> component. But is that possible only because of WordPress's dramatic success? I mean, in like I'm in the .NET space, which is certainly smaller than PHP, and there's a lot of like super useful, like low level stuff that people make, and maybe one or two people working on it, and they're all doing it entirely volunteerism. But you can't compare a small utility library in C Sharp that is used by ten thousand people to something like WordPress, which is used by I don't know hundreds of millions right. of people. But how do you get there? How do you introduce someone into open source and say, hey, this could also be a career and you could potentially get paid for working on this and get sponsored as well? I think in the WordPress space, it's very much that we continue to focus on non-developer experiences, right? Um, and, I, and again, I think that that's also opened us up to a lot of you know criticism, you know, good and bad over the years in that we don't prioritize developers. In some ways, we maybe make their lives worse because we require certain things around backwards compatibility. Um, And we ask that people create experiences within a WordPress admin that maybe doesn't provide everything experience wise. So you kind of have to get imaginative about how you integrate with it so that users are not left feeling like they're using 17 different products within, you know, one administrative interface. So like cPanel, right? Like every every single thing that you use in cPanel is like something different entirely, right? And we don't want that in the WordPress space. We want people to feel like, you know, when they click on something in WordPress to edit some settings or some content or whatever it is, that it's going to be familiar, that you're going to know what to do mm-hmm. sort of intuitively. Um, hopefully it'll kind of guide you through it and that you can save your changes and not have it destroy anything. Right, we we want to build this. We prioritize user trust is what we talk about. Um, so the mm. the trust of the user that they're not going to lose content, that they can try out settings and preview them without it being destructive or permanent. Um, these are all things that are about building user trust. But when we talk about users, we're talking about non non developer users. And so in that space, we have a much bigger audience, right? Um, of people who can use our products and use our work. Um, so you, you, there are people who develop, you know, like utilities in the WordPress space, right? Like th- things to like build themes on top of, um, various tooling. Like at Tenup, we do these things where we have like a Docker image that supports, you know, local WordPress development. Or um, I think we have like a, 
I don't know, a, a jobs system kind of thing that uses WordPress. So we have, you know, a, a bunch of things that, you know, are, are more technical developer oriented, but for the most part, especially what I work on in the, the open source end of things, these are things that are geared toward non-technical users, right? Um, mm-hmm. And I think that that's, that's been a big part of it is just that we are, we're appealing toward a much bigger group and a group that, you know, in many ways is used to paying for software, right? Or at least support for their software. Um, and so that's the space that we managed to operate in is the the consulting space, right? Providing mm-hmm. services. No one wants to manage databases if they can avoid it. And that's why MongoDB made MongoDB Atlas, a global cloud database service that runs on AWS, GCP, and Azure. You can deploy a fully managed MongoDB database in minutes with just a few clicks or a few API calls. MongoDB Atlas automates deployment, automates updates, handles scaling, and more so that you can focus on your application instead of taking care of your database. You can get started free at mongodb.com slash atlas. Now, if you're already managing a MongoDB deployment, Atlas has a live migration service, so you can migrate it easily with minimal downtime and then get back to what matters. Stop managing your database and start using MongoDB Atlas. So these these this core tenants, these kind of this we believe, you know, the Ten Commandments of, of WordPress and what you all believe, you, there's a core leadership team, right? And you've got the WordPress co-founder, Matt, and then there's five, is it correct? Five yes. lead developers and then a number of core developers. It's kind of, there's kind of a hierarchy there. Did that naturally happen? How did uh, you become a lead developer? <laughs> um, that's a really good question. Sometimes I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I, it's not a very clear or clean hierarchy. We have sort of these uh, labels and we sometimes function in those roles. I think that with, especially with Gutenberg and the way that it's changed like the pace and structure of development of WordPress itself, um, it's somewhat less relevant what what that named hierarchy <laughs> means. Um, but yeah, I, I started with... Um, wanting to understand what open source meant because I had no idea what it meant. I worked at a university as a web developer and we were using WordPress um, for some projects. And I thought, you know, I see something in the WordPress admin that looks funny to me. um, And I just want to like understand what, what does open source mean? They keep telling me you can, if you see something wrong, you can do something about it. And what does that even mean? You know, what's subversion? What, what is CSS? I don't know. Um, and so I submitted a patch. Uh, we use track. People hate it. Uh, but we use track and subversion and patch files still. Uh, so really? I, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, can, I didn't mean to say it like that. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> you can use GitHub. We, we have some you know tools around that. But yeah, for the most part, for years, it's been subversion, track, and patch files. No, I, I did um, that. I mean, I, I lived that whole thing that was 15 yeah. years ago. I still love patch files, but whatever. Um, so I <laughs> submitted um, a patch file for some CSS to fix like a border on something and mm-hmm. um, got some feedback very quickly that was like, you also have to make this other change. And like very quickly iterated on it and they, you know, merged it into WordPress. And that was like my first open source contribution, uh, I think about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, whoa, that's, I mean, just like the the quickness of that process. And I think that even then, you know, the the team was prioritizing first time contributors to kind of give you that satisfaction and let you decide whether or not that was something you wanted to keep participating in. And so I was, I was hooked on it and was like, oh, wow, this is super cool. I want to, I want to keep doing this um, and just kind of stuck with it. Some of it was front-end development, even though at the time I wasn't a front-end developer at all. I was like a PHP and MySQL applications developer um, and just kind of stuck with it. And over the years, I guess, gained, gained a lot of trust and went to a lot of community events. So we have WordCamps, right, like local local conferences about various aspects of WordPress. And so I would go to those and eventually uh, landed at 10up um, as a first employee, actually, um, about eight and a half years ago. Wow. And uh, landed at 10up and over the years had you know more and more community time, what we call it, 
um, given to me. And in 2013, um, after my first maternity leave, uh, when I came back to 10 up after maternity leave, I basically just never rolled back onto client projects and went full time into open source work. So I'm hearing that I'm interested in something. I'm going to poke at it. I want to understand this. And then showing up consistently. Like if you could, showing up is how you succeed in open source. You are, hey, it's Helen again. Oh, she is helpful. Oh, look at this. And then you just keep showing up until they, they, they move you up in the process. And they go, wow, the, the people who showed up are here. And the people who stop showing up, we don't talk to them anymore. Yeah. I mean, when everything is online, right? Like we're, we're using, now we use Slack and in, in that time it was IRC, but you're, mm-hmm. you're just doing, you know, text, text-based chat. Right. Um, and so my handle has always been Helen because there are not very many Helens, I guess. So even on Freenode, <laughs> I was just Helen. Um, I'm like, I, I was, I was Scott at AOL. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Early adopter. Yeah, I'm Helen yeah. on like GitHub and a whole bunch of things. So um, there's not very many of us, I guess. And so I always use my real name. So I think it was, I think even easier for people to recognize that I was mm-hmm. continuing to show up. And I think another part of it was also being willing to say like, oh, I was definitely wrong about that, right? Rather than mm. letting a mistake sit and fester and like never acknowledge it, Um you know, and especially in open source, because like somebody else will probably see it <laughs> at some point and experience it. Um, and I think there was also a lot of value in, in just being proactive and being like, wait, 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 uh, that was not great. Let's try something else. Or, mm-hmm. you know, I, I would like to, you know, revert my patch and try a different tack. Or here's a patch that, you know, is maybe a little too forward facing right now. Um but, you know, five years from now, it might become relevant. So let me just throw it up here basically for, you know, to see if it means anything later on. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of value in, in showing up and not necessarily like being hyper productive, right? Like, I think there's mm-hmm. too much focus on how do you define productivity and how do you meet, you know, goals and KPIs or whatever, right? And I think... I think that that in open source, at least, is not nearly as important. And it's much more important to be consistent and to be honest about what's mm-hmm. going on. And I think people do notice that. Um, I think that that's so true. Like, I think that we, we, and I'm, I don't know who the royal we is in this context, but we seem to mythologize the, you know, the, 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 the mean, super hyperproductive 10x developer. And it's all a myth. I would much rather have a very nice, pleasant, one X developer who shows up consistently is easy to work with and has both good technical skills and is also pleasant on conference calls. You know what I mean? Like what is the name for that developer? Let's have, give me 10 of those and we'll have a nice little project. (laughs) Professionals. I think is what we used to call Ah, them. Professionals. That is a very, I love that. We should make more (laughs) professionals. So um, the, this Gutenberg, I'm seeing. Uh, there's really interesting articles around, like you know, is Guten, you know, will WordPress survive Gutenberg? <laughs> you know, um, it's pretty interesting stuff, and it's it's a lovely editor. And one of the things that I've noticed about it is that, to your original point at the very beginning of the podcast, focusing on users, you know, when WordPress for me was the blog that allowed people to upload eight megabyte JPEGs and then resize them, ruin the aspect ratio and then keep them there (laughs) so that I could visit their website. And, you know, it's like, Oh, look, look look at my website for my bagel shop. And it's like a 25 meg website. And I hit F12 and I go, Oh my God, you uploaded an eight meg JPEG. But Gutenberg in doing that, it allows the, the customer to fall into what we at Microsoft call the pit of success. Like yeah. even if you mess up, it's you still succeed. Like your your images are pretty, and they have alt text, and they have title, and they got resized correctly. And you can't, you really have to work to mess up the aspect ratio. Why would anyone have a problem with that? That sounds great. Yeah, I you know I think there's oh let's see there there are a lot of things tied up in that. Um, one one thing is that separately from the editor itself, there have been um, there's been a big push to meet. Um, better web standards. I mean, WordPress itself was always about web standards. I know that when Matt talks about 
you know, the origins of WordPress, a lot of it was about wanting to have semantic HTML and microformats and pingbacks and trackbacks and RSS feeds and all of that, right? About being a part of the open web um, and being a part of, you know, information sharing. And so there is this continued push for, you know, web standards. So one thing that was implemented, I mean, years ago, um, before it was even, I think, a formal formal spec was um, responsive images, right? Where um, you upload stuff to WordPress and it does its best to chomp it into a bunch of different, you know, sizes and compressions and um, and make those available so that you're no longer defaulting to 25 meg images, right? Um, and I think another fairly recent change, actually, um, there were two two parts. One was longer ago, which was that somebody went through and did a, a whole study about um, the effects that changing the default compression would have on JPEGs. Mm-hmm. Um, so they used like an algorithm to detect like the differences and what is your threshold of tolerance as like a human viewer and presented all of that work. And so we changed the default compression and it, I mean, it saved, I don't know, this, the actual statistics are out there somewhere. So I'm not just going to make up numbers, but the Mm -hmm. amount of bandwidth that we were saving, you know, in such a large percentage of the web and with more and more people uploading images directly from their phones, right. Where we have Mm -hmm. like up until recently, no control over uh, the size of those um, I think made a big difference. And then you get into things like, you know, uh, serving up responsive sizes for different devices. And then I think Gutenberg itself as the editor, I think gives you a better sense of how exactly it's going to look Mm -hmm. on the front end. Right. So instead of figuring, okay, I'll just put the biggest size image because that's going to be the best possible look, no matter what somebody is using. Um, it gives you a better shot at understanding, you know, this, this image size is going to look great you know, in most situations. So. Yeah, it makes responsive design like for the humans, for normal people. Yes. Yeah, I've, I've been watching all of the like the web, like you know, I'm always impressed when you go to a website and you scroll down and then like they have like the really low res version of the image and then it kind of fades in because now it's in the viewport and you're looking at it. And then, you know, I, I'll put up like a really big animated GIF, but I don't want to mess up someone on a low data plan overseas all of that should be handled magically for me by some image thing in the background. But unfortunately, my images are just big, giant images that sit on an FTP server, and it's like, it's 2020. That's horrible. I should do better. I should get WordPress. Uh, well, we, you know, we would love for you to use WordPress. And if I, if I can plug something else, um, <laughs> one, one of the things that I've been working on recently, like within our own, like 10 up open source projects is a plugin uh, we call it classify. Um, I'm not. I'm not much for like. Oh, let's remember names of things. But um, it's a plugin that connects with various, you know, cloud services um, to sort of automatically process and categorize your content. Mm-hmm. Um, so right now we're using Azure. So yay! Shout out to Microsoft. Um, <laughs> we're using that for uh, image processing, right? So when you upload an image, it automatically gets back a caption as your alt alt tag. Um, and some taxonomy data, right? So like I see, like it sees a building or it sees a sandwich or whatever. So now you have all of that data um, in WordPress for you automatically. Mm-hmm. So not only for you as like the administrator or content creator on your own site, you're now able to like search for things without you manually having to tag everything. And then Ooh. for your readers, for the consumers of your site, they're getting alt tags, on images, again, without you having to necessarily put effort into it immediately, right? So instead of all of these images that have like, you know, DSC 1980 as their alt tag, because we picked that up from the file name, now you're actually getting a description of like, you know, a person smiling in sunglasses or whatever. Um, and so th- it's just a better experience all around for everybody, right? Mm-hmm. To be able to provide descriptive text for various technologies and users. And then for you as the content manager um, to actually be able to like find your content later uh, is really nice to have. So Fantastic. What is that plugin called again? Classify. So we spell it like classify, C-L-A-S-S-I-F-A-I. Right? A- oh, classify AI. AI. Very yeah. clever. Yeah. And that's a <laughs> classify plugin.com. I'll make sure to put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, Thanks so much for chatting with me today. 
course. Thanks for having me. We've been talking with Helen Ho Sandi. She's a lead developer at WordPress and the director of open source initiatives for TenUp. We'll have links to the show notes to Helen on uh, Twitter as well as tenup.com. Thanks so much. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.